All right, Uh, we're back here and we want to pick up in our study in Acts chapter number 2. I want to direct your attention in your notebook to page number 37. And uh, at the top of that page you read Peter's sermon, Jesus Christ was crucified but is risen. As we mentioned uh, before in this study, it was the resurrection of Christ, no doubt, that motivated the disciples, the apostles, to go into all the world and preach the gospel. At the crucifixion of Christ, although that was a high point historically for our salvation, it was a very low point for the apostles and the disciples. They felt that this was a failure. This was an experiment that had totally failed, that Jesus, as wonderful of an individual he, that he was, maybe not even knowing exactly who he was at that time, things didn't end the way they were supposed to. They saw his crucifixion. They, uh, maybe they didn't see it physically, but they knew from uh, the messages of other people, from hearsay that Christ had been crucified, he had been taken down, he had been buried, and they thought, it's over, it's all over. Three days later, Jesus came out of that grave and it turned ultimately the world upside down. It turned these individuals upside down. People that had been totally deflated now became excited and motivated to take the word of God and to face threats, physical threats, the threats of death, imprisonment, you name it. They were willing to face that to carry out the mission that Christ had given them in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and now here in the beginning of the book of Acts. So we pick this up on page 37, if you uh, have your notes there. Look at letter B. Jesus Christ was crucified, but he's risen. Again, we are reminded that the message is to uh, the nation of Israel. Uh, It says, ye men of Israel, and that's what we remember. We took the book and we outlined it. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost part of the earth. We're in Acts chapter 2. We're still in Jerusalem. The apostles have not left Jerusalem to fulfill the commission of Matthew chapter 28. They haven't gone into all the world. That is still yet future. They've been waiting for the promise of the Spirit. If you go down there to uh, verse 23, we talked about the sovereignty of God, the free will of man. Verse number 24, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death. The ultimate proof, as we've said, The ultimate trump card of Christianity is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you can prove that Christ is dead and he's buried, still, Christianity folds. It's over. What we believe is built on the foundation of the fact that our Savior lives. There is no other religious tradition that can claim what Christ can claim and what Christians can claim and what the Bible teaches. Notice in 25 through 28, it says, For David speaketh concerning him. And we see some Old Testament prophecies. We will not take time. You have these uh, thoughts written down in your notes. You can reference uh, the psalmist in uh, Psalm 16, and you can read this for yourself. But all of this is evidence that's presented to make the case that Jesus is both Lord, he is God, and that he is Christ, he is the Messiah. Go to chapter 2, verse number 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So this is the point and the purpose of, of Peter's sermon here. He is trying to convince the unconvinced. He now has the experience of seeing the risen Christ. He understands the mission that he and the fellow apostles and disciples have been given. He is energized. He is enthusiastic. He's starting to get the big picture of what's going on. And so he preaches to the Jews and he says, look what you have done now. What follows, again, is a controversial uh, 
piece of literature in the Bible. Look at verse number 37. We're going to read 37 up through 47. Now, when they heard this, they heard that Jesus is uh, the fulfillment of these promises. You can go back into verse 31, 30, 29, 28, 27. He's called the Holy One, etc., etc. Understanding that you have crucified God, the Lord, His Messiah, Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what are you going to do about this? When they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what should we do? Obviously, the people that asked this question got the point. They realized we have been wrong, and Peter is right. This all fits together like a puzzle now. Now we understand who he was, what he did, and why he came. To a degree, they don't have all the New Testament theology down, but they have enough to know that they have sinned, they need to repent, and they need to get right. They know that. Then Peter, after the question, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. Here's a picture of the early church. I love these last seven verses of chapter number two because we see what kind of people? We ask the question, you know, what kind of disciples, what kind of character, what kind of people? What we're seeing is what they were practicing in this early church in these last seven verses. They gladly received his word, <clears throat> those that did, and they were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about, excuse me, I'm going to take a, whoops, I'm not going to take a drink of water. I did have a drink of water, but we're going to get through this. <clears throat> says they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, and all that believed were together and had all things common. <clears throat> and they sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Things are going well. <clears throat> Peter, the disciples, the apostles, they're kind of on a roll right now. The momentum has shifted from the crucifixion and those three days that followed of doubt and despair and, and uh, all of that. Things have turned around. Christ has uh, appeared to them. The ascension has taken place. They've been commissioned to go into all the world and... Um, we have the preaching, we have Pentecost, we have this great revival taking place. Not everybody's buying into the program, so to speak, but many people, much more, many more people are buying into what's going on now than have been uh, up to this point. So, as they say, they're kind of on a roll. The momentum is shifting, and we get at the, um, particularly the last seven verses of this chapter, we get a pretty good picture of what's going on. They're united, they're together, and these are the kinds of things that are going on among them. But what we want to do is we want to take a couple, uh, a few moments, and we want to go back and look at this passage where it talks about in Acts 2, 37 and 38. Uh, what shall we do? Because verse 38 is an extremely controver controversial passage. Now, if you look at this, 
uh, you can understand reasonably why people would say, well, if you want to be saved, although that isn't necessarily what the question is, what shall we do as a result of crucifying Christ is really what the question is. Then Peter answers them and he says, repent, change your mind about Jesus. Repent and be baptized. Of course, in their mind, it, they can go back. We're not talking the distant past. We're talking about the ministry of John the Baptist, Matthew chapter 3, within three years. There was a baptism that John the Baptist had summoned the people of Israel to, to prepare themselves and to get ready for the coming of the Messiah. It would be my guess that the vast majority of these people present at this time had failed to do that. And if they had done it, they're getting further instructions as to what they should do. They should repent. You have crucified your Messiah. And you should be baptized, every one of you. This is an individual thing. Salvation is an individual choice. In this particular case, getting right with God and doing the right thing was an individual choice. You will be held accountable for your free will decisions. I believe that. I believe in being responsible. Respond appropriately to God's calling and God's truth in your life. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, what does that mean? That means everything that his name means and represents. For the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now this gift, this is the promise of the Father. This goes back to John chapter, four, John chapter 7, John 14, John 15, John 16, the passage in Luke that we referenced uh, earlier in our notes. This is the promise that they were waiting for. What do they expect? There was a place, I think, in our last chapter. What did they expect? I listed several passages that go back to the promise of the Father. Now they have the opportunity of being brought in themselves uh, in, into the fellowship of these believers. How can they do that? By repenting and be ba being baptized. And remember, there is a particular Jewishness of what's going on. Peter is preaching to Israel. Largely, m the, many of the Israelites have rejected the baptism of John. They understand what that was all about to some degree. And now Peter is saying, do it now. You have failed to prepare yourselves for Messiah, and that's what got you into this mess. Now, do right. Change your mind, get baptized, and get with the program, so to speak. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children, Israel, and to all that are afar off, that would be Gentiles, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So this is, this is kind of a, an opening. An opening in that this truth of Christ crucified isn't just for Israel. Although the initial preaching and teaching is going to the Jewish people. To the Jew first, also to the Greek. Again, Jesus said, I want you to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But Peter is telling us here, Simply this, we're starting with you and your children, Israelites, but we want you to know this is for everybody that's afar, even afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That's anybody. Anybody and everybody are uh, open or have the opportunity to respond to this call. And with many other words, did he testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation? You need to separate yourselves from these unbelievers. You need to get out. You need to differentiate yourself from those who have mocked, from those who have, uh, uh, have assented to the crucifixion of your Messiah. Repent. Be baptized a symbol of cleansing. Now, 
there are some that would take Acts 2.38 and they would extend that all the way into the church age and say, that's what everyone should do. That baptism is a necessary part of salvation. Now the problem with that is it's difficult to prove that in every passage where people get saved. Because in the book of Acts, you'll find several different, I'll use the term, formulas for salvation. There are people who receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and they are baptized after that happens. So I believe that's Acts chapter 10, Cornelius. And what, what we see in, in these passages is that there's no set formula for salvation. We find in other places in the New Testament that baptism is a symbol, it's a sign, it's a public testimony of one's faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Savior. It's a public display of getting up in front of people and saying simply this, I want you to know I'm a Christian, I'm saved, I thank God for it, and I'm identifying with Christ. Remember, disciples identify with Christ. They're not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. They're not ashamed of, of Christ himself. So they are identifying publicly in baptism and saying, I identify with Christ crucified, buried, and risen from the dead. That's the picture that is portrayed or painted in um, Christian water baptism. Baptism here was specifically aimed, I believe, at a Jewish crowd who had failed to follow John the Baptist in, in baptism and prepare themselves, and now they are in shock when they realize that they have made a huge mistake in crucifying the Messiah. So anyway, Acts 2.38. Let's, let's, uh, let's uh, go to page 42. 42 in our notes here. We see the passage that we've just read in the bottom of page 42, repent and save yourselves. Um, they heard this. They were pricked in their heart. 2.38 says repent and be baptized. And uh, we kind of spell this out. Repent. Change your mind and heart concerning Christ. Baptized seemingly teaches baptismal generation, but baptism was the outworking of the inward heart. Name of Jesus Christ, Peter is calling for a public demonstration of faith. True repentance will move an individual to action, that is, and result in the remission of sins. Then the Holy Ghost. You see all of this tied together in that Acts 2.38. Some important things to consider, and I may repeat myself here, so bear with me. This Pentecost experience is a once-in-a-lifetime event. Cloven tongues, wind, Israelites, speaking in tongues, all of these events never take place again together and in the same order. To attempt to extract the plan of salvation from this text is dangerous theologically. To further complicate the theology of this, the word baptism is used several different ways in Scripture. Now, I believe this is a water baptism. Don't misunderstand that by the list that follows. But the term baptism is used in all of these other passages, and some of them are not necessarily water baptisms. There is a particular Jewishness concerning this event. You can't deny that. We're in Jerusalem. The people that have been preached at are Jews from 17 different countries, the speaking in tongues and all that on Pentecost. We've seen that. Peter is addressing his people who have crucified, missed the Messiah. He quotes Old Testament passages that they should have been aware of that would have brought some light, something to mind, say, oh yeah, Man, we missed this, we missed that, we missed the other thing. But what's listed there is several different baptisms that are mentioned in Scripture. So we, we've listed them there at the bottom of page number 43, and you can uh, take the time, if you've never done this exercise before, to go through your Scriptures and look them up and see that. Now, what follows here uh, at the bottom of page 43 and 44 and 45 uh, is a three pages, actually there's two full pages here, of some explanations about this controversy in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. 
Now, the name at the bottom of page 43, Scott Grace, Scott Grace is my son. My son Scott is a uh, seminary graduate and um, a student of the Word of God. And uh, when I did this, Scott was working with me and for me. So in preparation for my sermon series, I asked him to do some research, uh, and he did just that. Uh, when he was in seminary, he served many hours in the library. It was part of his, one of his assignments, one of his projects, and so he got an extremely good working knowledge of uh, uh, materials in the library, in the seminary where he attended. So I asked him, I said, I want you to investigate this and give me some good writing on this. So I'm not going to take the time to read this to you. You can do that, but take your time going through page 43, 44, uh, 45. You can see we're talking about tongues, baptism, uh, for the remission of sins. Every one of these phrases or words is contested, it seems. It's really, uh, you can really get stuck in the mud in Acts 2.38, I guarantee you. So we've taken some extra time to give you some of these explanations here. You can read through them, and um, the people that are referenced are what we would call certified Bible scholars. We're not changing the Word of God. We're not changing the King James Bible. We're, always, we're only looking to people who are well-schooled in New Testament scriptures, and they're giving their opinions based on what they read and in other texts of the scriptures, what these scriptures mean and what they're saying. Uh, I think the, the work that Scott did here is really excellent. So we w I, want you to, I want to encourage you to take your time to read through pages 43, 44, 45, and then at the top of page 46, this will end. Okay. The last thing we want to say here before we close in just a few moments, the last thing we want to do is we want to look at this church. We read um, uh, verses 41 through 47. I said, I like this uh, passage of Scripture. It tells me a lot about uh, the early church, and that's what we're studying right now. What were these people like? Their character, uh, their behaviors, uh, their methods, their strategies, their priorities. What were the results that came about as, as a result of their obedience to the Lord? Looking through Acts 2.41 through 47, let's just kind of glance through. Notice in 41, gladly received. I like that. What did that produce? It produced baptisms and an additional 3,000 souls. Now, there could have been as many as a million people uh, in Jerusalem. Might have been 200,000, whatever it is. 3,000 isn't a large percentage, but it is a large number. And I don't, I've never been in a church that uh, experienced 3,000 conversions, true conversions. I'm guessing these are true conversions recorded in Scripture in, a br in such a brief period of time. <clears throat> but nonetheless, verse 42 they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. The word doctrine means body of truth. One of the things that really troubles me about Christianity today is the lack of Bible study. I didn't say Bible reading, of Bible study and really understand an attempt to really understand the doctrines of Scripture. For example, you can identify with this. This is human nature. Uh, we have a four-credit hour course in our Bible Institute called Systematic Theology. Doesn't that sound exciting? Systematic Theology. But I'll guarantee you the foundation and basis for everything important that we believe as a Christian is taught in that course. But when you look at the title, Systematic Theology, it sounds like it's rigorous. You gotta really think through this. There's a lot of work in this. This sounds dry. 
boring. Now, I will admit that that is, that kind of comes across that way. But people need to understand, you've got to understand the truth. The truths upon which Christianity is built. Our faith is not built on marshmallows. It's built on a solid rock. Solid rock of truth. That's what this book is. It's the truth. And we know, need to know this book as well as we possibly can. We need to pursue understanding truth, the body of truth or doctrine. So that word shows up here in verse 42. The apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Fellowship is important. But it's not the only thing that's important. I want to have fellowship. I want to have fellowship with other Christians. I want to feel like I'm part of the congregation, part of the group, just like you do. But I need to know some doctrine, some truth. And that's one of the purposes for teaching the book of Acts is to get some, uh, something solid underneath us. In breaking of bread and prayers, we have Lord's Supper and praying. All of these things, teaching of doctrine, Christian fellowship, Lord's Supper, Lord Communion, prayers. These are all things that were part of this church. And these are things that we ought to emphasize in our churches today. Doct <coughs> excuse me, doctrine, fellowship, the Lord's Supper, do this in remembrance of me. And we need to be praying individuals and churches. And the result of that, that fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. I said this a few moments ago, we're on a roll. We're, we're the momentum has changed. The church is marching forward as we come to the end of chapter number two. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Fear came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were united. They were in one accord. They were together. Together is the KJV word. And had all things common. They weren't self-centered. They weren't covetous. They were willing to share what they had when someone else had a need and they had more than they needed. They were glad, gladly willing to share what they had. They sold their possessions, if need be. They had more than enough. And goods imparted them to all men as every man had need. And as time went by, this Jerusalem church had a lot of needs. Because these Christians were being ostracized from their culture. This was a Roman culture and even more so a Jewish culture, and the Christians really didn't mesh with either one, didn't get along with either one of them. And so they found somewhat persecution by the Romans. Pilate was the one that okayed the death of Christ, the crucifixion of Christ. And we know the Jews were not happy. As we continue to read through Acts, we'll see that, that they're not happy, that they stone Stephen in Acts chapter 7 that uh, Saul or Paul is part of that group of people that did that but later on when he was converted he became the object of their persecution himself so the early church went through all kinds of persecutions as a result of that they had all things in common they parted them to all men as every man had need and they that is this early church in Jerusalem continuing daily with one accord, united in harmony with one another. Unity, again, is an attribute of God, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Trinity in unity. We are to be united in our churches. There are some of God's attributes that are not communicable. For example, being all-knowing, that isn't going to happen. Being everywhere, we're all powerful, no. But there are attributes of God that are communicable. God is love. God is one and God is united. And unity is something that God expects of his people in his church. They continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat, 
with gladness and singleness of heart. They weren't double-minded. They were single-minded. They were all working for the goal, for the purpose. They had a common goal, and they pitched in. They brought their resources to make them available, to put them on the table to accomplish the goals. And what did they do? They were praising God, and they had favor with all the people. Praising God, they weren't enemies of the culture. They were, they were teaching the truth, but they weren't running around criticizing those who disagreed with them. They taught the truth. They made the truth the important thing. The, their, their presentations were positive. With the exception of this Acts uh, sermon of Peter, Peter put, called them on it, called them to task on what they've done. But you see sermons that uh, occur following this. These sermons basically are positive. If you want to sell something, you tell people what's good about your product. You don't necessarily have to tell them what's bad about their competition, the other product. From house to house, they did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added, the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. Momentum added daily. Things are happening every single day. They see God things, God results. Now, if you go to page number 47 in your notebook, You'll notice this about the church, that it was a learning church, it was a loving church, it was a worshiping church, and it was an evangelistic church. And you can take the time, if you like, you can read through uh, each of those paragraphs that are mentioned there. Now before I close, let me just uh, state some of the things that are of vital importance, just by way of reminder. We are to be witnesses. We're to be called, we are being called on the stand of society, and we are being asked to divulge what we know to be true. We're to answer questions honestly and truthfully, and we're not to hide. We're to be witnesses. We're to be soul winners. We're to be evangelistic in nature as Christians. We're to do outreach, another word for soul winning and evangelism. We are fishers of men. That's what Jesus called his disciples to be. I cannot overemphasize those terms, that concept, enough. We are to be witnesses. We have been sent to do just that. We read in the early church the transitions in the book of Acts. We're going from the Gospels to the Epistles. And the book of Acts serves as a bridge there. We're going from Old Testament law, legalistic approach to theology, to grace. The truth of, for by grace are you saved through faith. We see several different, we see the transition from the kingdom of Israel, you know, the kings and the prophets and all that that entailed. We're moving to a church, one body. It's made up of Jews and Gentiles. It's not a physical kingdom. It's the kingdom of God. It's not meat or drink, but it's righteousness, peace, and it's joy in the Holy Ghost. So this is where we are going. We see the beginnings in Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2. And again, the church is gaining momentum. The church is gaining momentum, and it continues to gain momentum in chapter number 3. We'll pick that up next time. So we get into chapter 3. We see the gift of healing displayed by Peter himself. At will, he heals an individual. That's the gift of healing. It's not coming forward in some healing line and somebody slapping you up in the forehead and hoping that your lumbago or your headache goes away. The healings in the scripture are very marked healings. 
they're healings that are not easily reproduced. They are things that happen visibly and obviously to people, whereas me getting rid of my headache, it's based on my word or not my word, that where you take me. So anyway, as we close here today, we, uh, we're reminded we are witnesses. Let's be witnesses for Jesus Christ. Let's be true disciples. Let's be true students of the word of God.